Hello, Internet friends, and welcome to Keep the Game Moving. This week, another face many of you might recognize from Dundracon, from Gen Con, from Kubla Con, from Big Bad Con, from Dead of Winter, for the few of you who are cool enough to go to that. Uh, Matt Steele, thank you so much for joining us. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Great to be here. Thanks. I, I say us. I don't know who us is. I never, I always, just reflexively, I say thank you for joining. <laughs> I don't know. Weird things that you think of when your brain is empty. Um, yeah. So um, Matt is one of those GMs that if you see his name next to a game, you should sign up for that game. Whatever um, whatever he's running. I, I, you know, I have like four GMs that I say that I would run a game of them reading the phone book. And Matt, you are on that list. <laughs> uh, wow. Okay. Uh, it's a short list, but but um, yeah. you are on there. Uh, I think there are two or three actors that I, you know, that, that qualify in that same that same realm for me. It's like, yeah, I would watch that. I would watch them read the phone book. Yeah, that's the, that's that the old you know the old joke. Yeah. So, how did you get your start GMing? Well, um, let's see. I mean, I I, ha I have sort of an unusual um, <laughs> origin story, as it were, in in, ter in terms of gaming. Um, Please involve radioactive liquid. Please involve. Radioactive yeah, um, th there might have been, there might have been, but I, I, I don't know for sure. Um, <clears throat> so, <laughs> so um, I, I got introduced to role playing games uh, because I met a couple of college students when I was in high school, and one of them. <clears throat> um, like graduated, like almost immediately after I'd met them. And he had an incredible job. And his job was to, he, he was a backup railroad dispatcher, which meant that anywhere uh, within his uh, area, which was all of the state of North Dakota, uh, that someone called in sick or someone went on vacation, he was the dispatcher that would be called to fill in for them. So at a moment's notice, he could disappear. But also it meant he had a lot of downtime and he made good money. So he was a gamer and every game that came out, he would buy and then he would run it because he was a rules guy and he'd like to figure out how the rules worked, how everything worked. So for our group, we, he would run whatever happened to come out. And you know, this is, this is in the mid seventies, right? So all, all those early games that came out, D and D, Gamma World, Traveler, all of those sorts of things, um, he would run. But he would only run them until we'd done the we'd done the you know he'd sort of figured out what the rules were and then he was bored and he didn't want to run things anymore and other people did and so I ended up volunteering to run um, uh, to run Gamma World originally because like that was one of the games that I really enjoyed one of the other people in that group. Uh, was uh, in his college group was an astrophysicist, and he ran Traveler. And if you can imagine Traveler being hard sci-fi Traveler, <laughs> yes, um, it was that was amazing. And I'm like, I am not going to touch that. God, there's no <laughs> way that that me as a Star Trek geek is ever going to be able to handle that. Um, but uh, but Gamma World, I felt comfortable with, and so I ran I ran that for a while. Uh, and eventually picked up Traveler, and then um, and, and and other and you know and ran some D and D, but very different from a lot of people who got introduced you know, through D and D, and then played D and D for four years or five years or whatever, and maybe played another game or two. I played everything that came out for the, like the first three or four years that I was a GM. Did Did you have like a local game store where you you'd like go and see what the new stuff was, or no? Yeah, I'm um, imagining in North Dakota the scene is a little different. Yeah, I mean the nearest place that sold RPGs was 100 miles away. Um, so uh, was it a Walden some, Books? Walden Books used to be like it, Walden, like Walden Books for for people who are young was a store in a mall, <laughs> and it was a they had a surprisingly good games like RPG section. Yeah, it wasn't a Walden Books. It was. Um, it was a hobby store, uh, like, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, it was a hobby store. Uh, so it had, uh, like, radio control um, airplanes and plastic and models, which I was very into, which is why I went into the store originally. It, it may even be where I met the, 
<laughs> those the crazy college students that I met. That I met, but uh, yeah. So no, there wasn't a local gaming store. Oh, one of the true. one of the guys that uh, that I eventually drafted into my gaming group uh, was uh, a- after I moved, opened a gaming store in in <laughs> in that town. That's cool. Uh, so yeah, I mean, so, yeah, it sounds like cool. there for years people were traveling kind of a long distance to get involved in games just because that was, you know, you sort of went where the game was. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we, we didn't really have a choice. I mean, that was the only place to buy them. And uh, yeah. And the only place to go and look at something, right. And really see like, I mean, yeah. And there wasn't a place where we could just go down and like flip through dragon magazine and find out what was cool or what was coming out or anything like that. Like you had to go and look and like whatever they had, like right. that's, that's what we got to pick from. But, you know, fortunately, they had some cool stuff, you know, and then, you know, I had my friend who bought everything. So that's, that's always a nice, a nice thing to have, you know, when yeah. you have that, that person who can just sort of pick up whatever, and uh, then when they're done with it, can kind of pass it off to you, and you can, uh, you can use it. Um, so you have, you know, you run the gamut of you run games at cons, you run games for, you know, you have several gaming groups that you play with. Um, and, and, you know, you, you, you are, I think, as s- several people, we've talked about sort of the dichotomy of one-shots versus campaign games. Yeah. And then I actually think there's even a difference between a one-shot with friends and a con game, you know, and that, like, how I approach it is, is different. Um, a, I don't run a lot of one-shots for friends, but, uh, like, how, what do you see as, how do you approach a con game that you're running differently than like a campaign that you're going to run at home? Well, with, with convention games, um, it, it's, it's really, um, it, it's really about something that I struggled with for a long time, which is bringing the game in on time. <laughs> you have a limited time window. Uh, and, uh, you know, for many, many years, I purposely scheduled myself to be, well, first of all, I run a lot of horror games. So I like to run them at night. Uh, because, you know, jumping into a horror game at 10 o'clock in the morning, it just doesn't quite have the ambiance that you want, right? So it, they're, they're, they're better at night. And then I could go long with that because if it's the last game session of the night, if we go over, we're not interfering with, with anybody else. Uh, there's not another GM coming into the room who needs it. And so so there's some there's a little bit of leeway there. And I, I still like running at night, but I try not to do that um, to run over part and uh, because my my late realization was that that's really a disservice to the players at my table because they're staying up late and you stay up late at a convention anyway but people who actually want to go to bed and be uh, coherent the next day like that's that's a real disservice to them so eventually my realization was like you really need to bring the game in on time even if you're running even if you're running late right if your game goes to 2 a.m people are you know <laughs> in till 2 a.m staying up till keeping them up till three or four is not is not okay so um so i actually when i plot out a convention game uh i i, I write down all of the scenes and estimate how long those are going to be uh and then i use that bullet list basically as my outline for running the game and i'm watching the clock the whole time to see if i'm if i'm on time and if i'm if i'm running a little fast then i know i I have some leeway to let people do more role playing and more sort of fitzing around if they want to. And if I'm running behind, I know I need to sort of truncate things or move things along. Um, so that's, and, and I don't do that with with a game that I'm running with uh, with friends, even if it's a one shot where we don't have those time constraints, where you know we can be or we can be a lot more flexible. Uh, and with campaign play, um, I literally was having this discussion last night with campaign play. Um, it's uh, I, I can let people like be in the moment and role play because some of the best moments in games are not around things that happen in the story. Some of them are, some of the story reveals and things like that are great, but it's those moments between the characters, between the players that really, you know, the, the people talk about later, right? Like, yeah. These two people did this thing together and that was amazing, right? This person said that and that was amazing. And those things don't always unfold if you don't, give them time to role play. And so that's one of the great things about uh, campaign play is you can you can let it breathe a lot more. I have to admit, I've picked up a bad habit from running games on stream. I'm always thinking about cliffhangers now. 
when I'm running mm. an episodic game, I'm all because uh, you know when I'm running on stream, it's like a weird combination of campaign slash con game because we're ending at nine o'clock, no matter what. You know, well, we can fudge it a little, but we're ending at nine o'clock, and so right. um, in my head, I'm like, what's a good ending point? How do I get you know? And and about eight o'clock, you start to like go. Am I going to get to this point? Am I going to do that? Um, and it's, um, I noticed that I was doing it in my home game as well. <laughs> you do something really interesting. Um, I'm going to admit here that I, I wasn't cheating, but I was sitting next to you at a game you ran at a con, and I could see the sheet that you had written, uh -huh. just the bullet points on it, and you yeah. had actually time triggers on that sheet yeah. where mm -hmm. essentially like if it's 7 o'clock and this hasn't happened yet, this happens. And and I thought that was a really interesting approach to a one shot. How did you kind of come up with that? And how does that, um, how, how does that work in practice? So there's, there's, uh, so it doesn't always work in practice. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, I try and I try and figure out when I'm when I'm making transitions and, and estimate how long things are going to take based on the game system that I'm playing. Right, Be because different game systems, like combat, takes longer in some game systems than in others. Right, so you have to you have to keep that in mind when you're running something. Um, and then, um, I mean, the the one that you may be talking about um, <laughs> is it was, the War, it was the the ship, the hospital ship, the hospital ship game. Yeah. So in the hospital ship game, uh, again, it's a certain. Uh, I mean, there's there's limited time uh, length for that. So. I know that I need to have, I need to get into a certain scene by a certain time. Uh, there's a bit of a cheat that's possible with that particular game because it's happening in uh, the Dreamlands, HP Lovecraft Dreamlands. Um, and so it's, I, I can, in that particular game, I can manipulate things because the actual form of the Dreamlands where they are is actually, is created by an NPC who, is kind of the bad guy in the story. So he's able to adjust adjust the dreamlands through his dream. He's simultaneously awake and dreaming at the same time. And so uh, so he has some sort of, he has a, a limited amount of physical control over the environment. So uh, that let me just be able to change things on a moment's notice. Um, yeah, I mean, in a recent running, the characters were actually running the wrong way. They were going the wrong physical, like, directly the opposite way that they needed to to get through the scenario and i just had them emerge where i wanted them to emerge because it's the dreamlands and i had that flexibility yeah. there so yeah. it's like oh you, you come up here you think the ocean should be here but it's not and it's I mean, a horror game so they were like ah that's a really interesting sort of you know scenario note like how do you how do you kind of bake that into your your you know your design when you're like you know you kind of like I do the same thing you do where my 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 game is very much bullet points and kind of figuring they're gonna get me there um, when you're when you're building the scenario itself are you you know I I um, I talked with with Colin Dimock our, our our buddy Colin and you know he very clearly says. I come up with the ending and then I work backwards, you know, and I'm like, okay, they need this, this, and this to, to get to the ending. Here's how I'm going to get them that, that, and that. Like, how do you kind of approach a scenario like that? How do you build the scenario? Oof. Um, I'm, I'm very scattered in terms of how I create scenarios. Um, so for, for Call of Cthulhu specifically, Lovecraftian games specifically, um, I use the, there, there's an encyclopedia uh, for Lovecraftian stuff. And and I will just flip through it until I find an interesting idea and then and then uh, look at all the cross references and build a storyline out from there. Um, but, uh, but I'll often do something similar to what Colin does, which is where, uh, I'll, I'll come up with uh, with either with one of two things: either the ending, an ending that I think is that could be interesting, um, or a premise, like a thematic premise. So I have a scenario that I call "Further North," and the idea behind the scenario "Further North" is that 
the characters don't realize until most of the way through the scenario that they are actually the evil. They're actually the bad guys. Uh, and the NPCs that they that are challenging them that are up that they're up against are a group of typical Call of Cthulhu investigators. And they're trying to stop them. Uh, the characters are compelled to go further north because, as it turns out, they are each avatars of Narlethotep. And so Narlethotep, so there's an evil cult who's using magic to lure them to this place so that they can use them, which, which is going to kill them, right? Um, either because they manifest as Narlethotep uh, or they don't and the magic just destroys them, right? So... So they're pretty much a group of people who are doomed. The, the, the thematic thing that I wanted to deal with at the end was how do they choose to deal with that? Mm. Um, you know, they, they could try and take themselves out before they, uh, you know, before they can be used. They could turn themselves over to the group of investigators and see how that goes, right? Once they realize that that's the goal of that group is to stop them. And they're like, well, maybe they know something and they can help me. Uh, and the third one is to be like, the third option is that they might say, well, no, I'm going to see this through to the end and see if I can resist, uh, you know, the machinations of the cult. Right? So there are three possible... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there are three possible ending, three possible endings for each of the characters. Three, three different ways for them to get out, and I just found that that the, the tension of that, you know, that final scene where you know there's the cult and there's the investigators, and these people are stuck in the middle, and how do they resolve getting out of that was an, was interesting thematically, and you know, and then the story is just how do they, then how do they get there, right? What are the pieces that that get there? How do they come to realize that they are who they are? Um, and, and all those things, right? How do they, where do they first encounter the, you know, the traditional, uh, you know, group of investigators and what does that, you know, what does that scenario feel like? How do they meet each other? Cause they're not a group of friends or investigators already. So. That's a really, you know, it's an interesting framing having the antagonists be, uh, the, the team of investigators, you know, cause, um, it, it means you, you really have to kind of indicate early on how you know you sort of have to give them the trait the trappings and the actions of the investigator party to sort of clue them in right yeah and you know i've run and played so much call of cthulhu it's easy to sort of look at that from the other side right if you're you know if you're these people and suddenly there are these people chasing you and they're this strange bunch of people one of them looks like a flapper dilettante and some guys a private investigator and other guys looks like a college professor and then they're shooting Thompson some machine guns at you like what what like that's insanity that's like a crazy situation. like who are these people so I just thought turning that on its head was was interesting and then having the you know the, the thematic element at the end and of course explosives you know any any call of Cthulhu party usually ends up with explosives involved yeah I I don't think so in this particular scenario because none of them, none of the player characters are really action-y sort of people. Like that was right. also one of the things I didn't, I specifically didn't want them to be investigators. I wanted to, you know, as characters create, you know, regular people who are stuck in a tough situation. Cause some of the best horror is about that regular people who find themselves in a horrific situation and they have to deal. Yeah, I think that's, that's true. Now kind of, you know, we, as we go to cons and we run games, we sort of now have this portmanteau of like, you know, eight or 10 games that we could kind of, with some zhuzhing, run at any time. You know, we sort of have a, a, a catalog of games that we can run. How, um, how do you deal with, uh, um, how do you deal with keeping that fresh? Like, you know, if you've run a game, the same game multiple times, does it, does it kind of, you know, I, I've found that there's like a two or three game sweet spot where like after two or three runs of it, I'm like, hey, I know what this game's about. Like how, where, wh where's that for you? And how do you kind of keep it new and fresh every time? Are, are, are you talking about the same game system and yeah, setting or, or, the same, or the same, or the same scenario? The same scenario. Okay. The same. Like repeated adventure. Yeah. Um, boy. Um, <laughs> 
I, I, I find it really interesting to put the same scenario in front of very different groups of players uh, because you don't know how they're going to react, right? You, I mean, it, when you're running for your friends, you begin to know pretty quickly how, how they're going to react, right? Especially if you're playing any sort of campaign play or you've played with somebody a lot, right? You have, you know, kind of a take on what it is that they're, you know, the kinds of things that are going to interest them or attract them or, to, you know, make them bored. And, um, but when you're running, especially at conventions where, you know, you may get a friend or two of yours in the game, but you may not, you may have a whole table full of people you, you, you don't know. Um, then they're making different choices based on you know completely different context. I mean, if, if you run, uh, we come back to Call of Cthulhu here a lot, but you know, I mean, uh, you know, I, I sit down with a lot of people who play and run Call of Cthulhu, right? And then at a convention, you can get someone who's never played. Right? So if you're running for people who have, they're always sort of second guessing, like you know, what's what what is this scenario uh, about? Is this a Narlathotep scenario? Is this you know, is this a fungi from yoga scenario? Like what's what you know, what what is? It? And they're looking for those clues and sort of acting on those to some degree. And but if you've never played Call of Cthulhu, you don't know, right? Yeah. So you're really really struggling, uh, you know, trying to you know figure out what's going on and how things are working. And so you try things, you know, those close players try things that no one has ever tried in another, another scenario, uh, running in the same scenario. And so um, so that makes it really interesting. Um, I mean, I've run some scenarios eight, eight or 10 times, um, especially, especially scenarios that are very sandboxy because there's so much flexibility for the players to uh, to do different things every time. Um, I mean, there's a there's a scenario that I just ran again recently, uh, which I which is called our our little town, and um, it basically has two scenes. <laughs> it runs from four to six hours, and it has two scenes. Re really, like. Uh, sort of a third scene and then a wrap up kind of, but um, it's it's very sandboxy and people just do what it is that they want to do. And really it's set up to create tensions between those characters, present them with situations and see how they react with it and, and where they take it. And man, that game runs different every single time. And so it, that, it, it's interesting. Games that are really well plotted out, um, uh, for me, don't hold my interest uh, for uh, as over repeated plays. Uh, if you're if you're running a campaign for your your home game, are you creating all new material? Are you kind of adapting existing material? Is it some unholy Frankenstein of both? What's your kind of, <laughs> um, as opposed to the holy Frankenstein? I don't know what the yeah. Um, it's 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 a little bit of a mishmash. Um, I, I I do a lot of original material. Um, I I like picking up adventures and reading through adventures to find ideas or you know uh, different things like that. Uh, in, any any game master I know who's worth worth their salt uh, will take a published scenario and then make it their own, right? And never. <laughs> Like I've I've read scenarios, published scenarios that I've played in later, and I'm like, oh, geez, like that GM really took a lot of liberties with with uh, elements of the story to to personalize it, and that's one of the things that I do as well. Like I'll read through something, and you know, I've, I I run you know a, a fair number of published scenarios, and I run like official games for Monaco Games because I'm part of their mm -hmm. asset team. Um, so, you know, those games run pretty pretty straightforward. But even with all of those, there are things that I have done to kind of personalize them because there are moments that I see in there like, ah, like that's a good moment and it could be emphasized a little bit better, made more interesting for the for the players, right? Um, and so no matter what, like I'm, I'm always doing at least a little bit of original tweaking. Um, with, with, with a lot of campaign stuff, uh, I, I don't tend to run published campaigns uh, yeah Gen generally speaking i'm running like original yeah original storylines that i come up with 
mean, that's my whole reason for role playing is storytelling. So right. That's right. <laughs> that's yeah, I, I think the other the other aspect that comes in there is when you're playing in a campaign, especially with folks you know, the players' stories become more as important, let's say, as the plot. You know, and and you could have kind of a through line plot of you know at midnight on December thirty first, this cult's going to do this. But this is also a story about you know this guy who got turned into an immortal gorilla through a curse, and how does he get that curse gone, and that sort of thing. And it you know it it things that happen during the run of it can become major plot points. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in my uh, I mean, right now I'm running an Invisible Sun narrative, and our our last session was was literally a mix of um, I'm, I'm running the players through the directed campaign, right? So, so that's a, that's a published campaign. Well, it's not published campaign. You have to actually uh, purchase it. It's a little complicated, but anyway, um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a directed campaign because you, I'm actually uh, uh, integrating directly with Monty Cook games. Like I, I'd let them know what happens in my scenario and then they send me stuff that's, um, that's specific to the direction that my campaign is going. Um, and then they leave a whole bunch of things to me. Uh, but because we've been doing this for, uh, we've been playing this narrative for uh, two and a half years now, uh, there's a lot of backstory that, that's, hap that's happened. And so this last session was essentially the jumping off part of a new chapter. And so part of the group is actually uh, following an element of the directed campaign um, that I introduced in the game. And then part of them are following uh, following up on things from, from almost from the very beginning of the original campaign that are completely character driven, right? Completely about things that they did, cho choices that they made uh, and things that I introduced to complicate and make things more interesting. Um, and I managed to weave those two stories together and send the group all off in the, you know, in the same general direction, um, mixing those two things together. Uh, um, is that is that cipher system? It's uh, not specifically. It, it has some of the same elements as cipher system. So all the characters are built from a sentence, and that gives you the you know the sort of core elements of all the character uh, character elements. Um, but it introduces another element, and then it has magic and all kinds of other things on top of it. Uh, and the game system itself runs differently. Cypher mm. system is a D20 system, and um, Invisible Sun rolls is uh, dice pools, sort of. They're very small dice pools, but D10 dice pools. Uh, and the interesting thing is that um, the, the D10 dice pools are zero through nine. Huh. So the so the zero so the the zero is actually a zero in that case. It's a zero, yeah. So if you have yeah if you have yeah d yeah, tens, they're they're numbered zero through nine, and usually zero is a ten. Um, but yeah, in this particular system, it's a zero. And the reason for that is because when you're when you anytime you're doing anything, you're rolling at least one die, uh, and so that's a mundane die for any particular task that you want to do. So you know if, if you're if you're trying to walk across a tightrope, right? You you know, you roll one, you know, for balancing. Uh, but in Invisible Sun, all the characters are Vizle, which are, who are people who can do magic. And all of them can use magic to do, to, to enhance almost anything that they do, right? Except for other magic, right? So any sort of mundane, regular task, they can use a little bit of magic. Well, anytime you're using magic, you roll another die, you roll magic die. And you might roll up to three additional die that are all magic. Uh, and any time you roll on the magic die and you roll a zero, um, <clears throat> then magical flux occurs. Mm. So something goes wonky with the magic that they're trying to do. And depending on how many of those die, those magic die come up zero, it's you know more or less uh, you know, impactful. A little that's a little Warhammery where you know if you're if you're playing a Warhammer fantasy role play and you miscast a spell you know, weird things can happen all the way up to yeah. a demon pulls you down to hell, you know, if you, if you do really, really poorly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we had a, a small earthquake happen in a, in a session not too long ago because somebody rolled, yeah, that rolled badly. So, you know, we've talked a lot about Call of Cthulhu, which is a game you and I both love. Um, we also share a love for 
in my opinion, the the prince of role playing games, Paranoia, uh, which is an a, you know an experience. I, I mean, I call it the first story game because mm -hmm. when when Paranoia came out in the eighties, there was nothing else like it, and. No. The idea that you had six clones, so why not? I'll push that button that says "Don't push" because I've got another one. Was right. you know was really revelatory, um, and you know so so when you run you know you and I run very different paranoia games, <laughs> uh, um, and you know the thing that I really appreciate about your paranoia games is that you run them eighty percent straight. You know, there's like. Uh, uh, you know, mine is just madcap, like, you know, stuff's going to go on. And right. yours is like, you're playing the game the way that it was meant to be played, which is, you know, like in my game, they always get out of the briefing room. In your game, getting out of the briefing room is a major success. <laughs> yes, yes. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I've had, yeah, I've had in many, many characters die in the briefing room. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, I had a, at a I had a mobile briefing room in one game that would seal up when you got in the briefing room and you only had as much oxygen in there. Um, yeah, so you could run out of oxygen and the entire party could die running out of oxygen if you didn't get through the briefing. So, because and, players will tend to like take forever in the briefing room and slow everything up, I'm just like, yeah, I'm just going to put a ticking clock on this, and that's how that's going to go. And I mean, one of, you know, anytime you talk with a paranoia GM, the, you know, I think how they approach the computer is always one of my first questions. And, you know, uh, your computer in the games that I've played has been, uh, uh, you know, a very kind of dry presence that I really like. It's just a very kind of just the facts sort of uh, uh, utterly dangerous and terrifying, you know, <laughs> almost disassociated personality kind of thing. Like, how do you, what, how do you see the framework of the computer in that sense? And, and like, how do you kind of, how do you characterize that? Um, so, so all of, all of my framing for running paranoia comes from the first time I ever played it. <laughs> and, and I played it with the, uh, the, the GM for that game was the guy who wrote the original scenario that came in the GM screen. Kostikian? Um, n no. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever met any of the original creators of, of Paranoia. Um, <clears throat> I did pitch a screenplay to them once, and they told me to go away, which was, <laughs> which was smart of them, which was smart of them. Um, uh, anyway. Uh, yeah, I, I think maybe no one should ever make a movie about paranoia. Yeah, it, just, that's... It, would, it would just be madness. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, no, uh, he was a guy here in the Bay Area, and he, uh, yeah, he, he just he wrote that one scenario that came came in. It was a standalone scenario, and it's with um, the uh, uh, the troubleshooters get into a submarine and they have to go to this underwater base, right? And so he he just ran like the way that he ran the computer framed my my thinking around around how the computer works right and and then also just the description of it right like the computer is your friend um you know the you know the the computer will drive you mad um <laughs> you know that that sort of framing um you know g gave you know, gave me the handles for the computer in, in the game, right? The computer always comes across as friendly, like always in my games, like always, 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 right? Um, even, and, you know, appears at the worst possible moments, right? When you're in the middle of a, a battle, right? And, you know, your PDC goes off and it's the computer. It's like, hi, how's the mission going? You know, just super cheery. And when things are just going really, really horrible, like that's the best time to bring in the computer being really, really cheery. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of my framing is the computer is so friendly that it, that it makes you crazy. <laughs> and how do you kind of, how do you, do you, do you set a trigger or something to kind of set players? Uh, cause you know, we run at cons a lot and if people haven't played paranoia, yeah. that style of game, which is pretty much player conflict from the start can be right. a, a, a little bit of a different thing for them. So kind of how do you how do you how do you trigger that in players? So so 
um, I, I do a lot of the same kind of intro for that particular game, which is which is I say that you know you, you all have security clearance. The best way to advance in security clearance, right? Which means you get better food, you get better weapons, you get better places to live. Like your life can only get better <laughs> by turning in and executing common mutant traders, right? That's the, 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 those three things, right? You got you have to do that. Um, however, and, and all all common mutant traders, right? All citizens of Alpha Complex are property of the computer. So you have to prove that someone is a coming mutant trader before you execute them. Because if you can't do that, then you're damaging computer property. And that is treasonous and punishable by execution. Um, which means, and, and, and you know, who, who, can, who can do that on a whim? Well, troubleshooters who surround you at all times. You're gonna be with troubleshooters all of the time. And you know, those troubleshooters, um, you know, are, you know, it, it's entirely possible that they are, uh, you know, either members of secret society, which is treasonous and punishable by execution, um, uh, mutants that are, are undeclared, which is treasonous and punishable by execution, you know, and, and, you know, I sort of set up all of the things and then say, you know, and you are constantly surrounded by all of these people and the only way for you to advance is to point out that somebody around you is one is a coming mutant trader, and be able to execute them so that you can advance. Um, How do you deal with the? Um, so, like in my games, I have just a an utterly co uh, a contrived mechanic that says that when you die, you come back and you don't remember the last fifteen minutes of your life, just mm -hmm. to kind of, and that's just to undo the, you killed me, zap, as soon as you come back. How do you kind of deal with yeah. that? Or do you even, do you just let it happen? Um, no, I have I have something similar. In fact, I ran an entire scenario based on this idea. Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, pulled from a really old, terrible movie called, uh, what's it called? Um, Overdrawn at the Memory Bank. Um, oh, that sounds familiar. Yeah. Uh, I recommend no one see it. It's really horrible, <laughs> horrible movie. But, um, but uh, my rationale is that, um, is especially as uh, characters are moving around in Alpha Complex, right? They're uploading, right? Their memories are being uploaded, right? And there's there's like because every single citizen's memories are being uploaded. There's a buffer. Right? There's a buffer that's happening, right? And the and the buffer doesn't necessarily keep up with uh when you know when when a clone dies and so you know it can get that's information can get lost in the buffer uh and so that's that's my in-game rationale for it is that there's there's you know buffer i like it uh, and and in the in the in the game that i ran uh overdrawn at the memo max machine um what ended up happening when different characters uh if multiple characters died at the same time uh, I downloaded their memories into the bodies of the other clones <laughs> so that when I would hand them back or when I would, you know, get them, I, I would, I would take people's character sheets away from them and give them to the other, other people. Uh, so, so we, we did uh, uh, one of the weirder things that we've done was we ran a paranoia <laughs> mini con where, yes. um, where you and I switched games at the break. And we were running different systems, and I only sort of knew how to run. You were running second edition Paranoia, and I was running first edition Paranoia, I think. And I only sort of knew how to run it. But um, yeah. so at the break, we all went off and got our lunch, and then we came back. And I just sat down at your table, and I said, uh, the, you know, uh, the, you hear the computer's voice. What's the situation, citizens? And they, like, I knew... I knew the the first sentence about your game, and I think you were in a similar situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, <laughs> as a as a GM who loves improvisation, that was really one of the more fun moments. Yeah, I mean, that was a great that was a great situation where we had I think we had four or five different paranoia GMs all running different systems, and uh, yeah, and none of us really told each other what the what our scenarios were. Um, so we yeah we just ran them and then turned them over to whoever sat in our, sat in our seat. Um, 
So, yeah, I mean, I ended up doing something similar, which is, uh, you know, the thing, one of the things that I do regularly in paranoia games is just the computer just butts in and asks, like, how's the advent? You know, how's the mission going? Give me an update. Right. And then you know, they're scrambling around trying to, you know, and then, you know, the computer will ask questions. Is that really, is that really the, you know, the goal of the mission? Please, please repeat the goal of the mission so I can be certain that you have it, right? <laughs> and then, you know, you just get the players the, the sort to of feed, loaded you, feed you the scenario, right? The and sort of loaded like, questions oh, okay, that I see where this is killed very quickly in Paranoia. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the other aspect of that game that, that I think was more of a challenge than I, I had anticipated was whenever someone died in that game, we would pull them into a pool and then move them to another table. And we would yeah. swap the 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 players around, um, which again we were playing five different systems, including one person was playing a game that wasn't even Paranoia, right? And um, you know that that so it really kept the players and the GMs uh, 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 on edge, not knowing what was going on. Um, and you know that I think that was like a half baked idea, but um, you have started to enter into I think a really neat world, which is playing these kind of mega games where you're you're dealing with multiple running i should say running these mega games or yeah. what do you call them event games i think you have a term for it yeah that, yeah they're mega mega okay, games mega yeah, games. yeah. yeah. Yes. and and so um you know folks who uh, who who watch will have heard morgan and i talked a little bit about um the me the 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 uh what was it? Assault on, don't call it the Death Star or whatever. Assault on Singularity Base, yeah. Assault on Singularity Base. You know, yeah. that was that was a, a version of this where there were five different tables all doing different things. And they were, you know, they were interconnected to various degrees. Um, and, you know, so you've been, you've done several of these now. So what are kind of the pros and cons of, of that model? So the, the tough thing is uh, you're running them at conventions. And so the logistics of getting them to work at conventions can be really tough. Um, I mean, on the, on the West Coast here, we have the good fortune of having most of our game spaces be private individual rooms. <clears throat> there, I mean, there's some exceptions where two games will share a large suite or something like that. But for the most part, we're really lucky because those games are in, Games are in individual rooms, <laughs> but the problem is when you do that, or when you, you know, when you're coordinating with the convention staff, um, <clears throat> in most cases, because the games are interconnected, they have to be physically close to each other. <laughs> um, the first time that we, or not the first time that I was in this, the second time that that I was in running uh, Gatsby and the Great Race, right? Um, <clears throat> those there, there are. There are people who move, uh, there, there are GMs who don't run the actual at table game. They coordinate all the stuff that happens in between them, right? And because the rooms were physically far apart, the logistics of, 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 player, uh, of player interaction and connecting those games to each other was really difficult for them, like physically difficult for them because they had to like run down the hallway and, and, and do things. Um, in Assault and Singularity Base, uh, that happened to us at one location, which is that the the hotel is square, and at the corners are these big empty spaces. And we had, you know, like if you look at the map, they look close together, but they're not. Right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> Poor and so, Jack got you know, his steps so our, yeah, our friend Jack Young got stuck running between uh, between those different rooms, um, and you know, it, it it worked out, but. But that's the biggest challenge is the logistics. Uh, the fun part is working with all the different GMs and coordinating, like who's running what, and you know what, you know what part of the scenario they're running, and uh, you know, and, and and knowing that when you step into those, that like all those GMs have a different style, and that that's going to make for really interesting uh, transitions for the players uh, throughout the course of the game. But yeah, the logistics, the actual at, you know, in space logistics are the tough part. And it's, you know, I think to me, the, the, the biggest fun of that was at the end when everybody came together and told their various stories of how they, you know, how, what the, how their team had led to this, you know, victory 
or or defeat in you know a, a few sad cases you know yeah. um I, I i think that that kind of debrief building that into the thing was really a fun a, a fun a fun part of it yeah i've i, I ran a solid singularity base at uh, gen con for money cook games right <clears throat> and there it's all done in one room and it's all done in four hours and they invite people if they want to to do that afterward um and sort of chat about it. We we baked it in, and I think that was really fun. I mean, we did a thing, and I showed this. I showed this to the, our, our friend Davi Anderson. Made us a screen crawl, you know, Star Wars style screen crawl, and we we would launch all of those games by getting everyone you in the room. You just admitted it was Star Wars style. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. Victory. <laughs> Yeah, we I mean, were, you know, we were forbidden from calling it Star Wars during well, the. Uh... Well, because it's not. Um, <laughs> It's not in that. It's not in that universe. But you know, it's that style, right? So, you know, and um, so uh, so we, you know, uh, we we had that video, that little bit of video, and then uh, and then we did a, a briefing, a mission briefing, an in-person mission briefing with all of the people in the room. You know, very much like very cinematically, like with all of the teams, and they're all sitting down, and they're they're all color coded. We color coded. They're all color coded. And then it was like, okay, green team, go with you know your green leader, and blue team, go with your blue leader, and and then everyone scattered to different rooms. And so that's you know we built that as an hour ahead, and then we, you know, in that you know, and then we had the hour afterward built in, because that's so much part of the fun of that scenario is talking about like what happened in your room and what happened in your room, and you know, um, because of the way that the, that scenario has interconnected actions. Like some people, like oh, that happened in our room because you did that thing. Mm -hmm. Like oh, oh man. Uh, so yeah, it was you know it was also I think a really good way to introduce someone to kind of the mechanics of a system because it was it was breezy, it was fast paced. Yes. Um, it kind of you know it didn't overstay its welcome. Um, you know that that that's an interesting idea to kind of use that kind of model as sort of a, a build. I mean, Gatsby is a whole different experience because I, yes. I Gatsby is a much more kind of convoluted construct. And, um, and you know, Assault on Singularity Base, you could play multiple times. But like Gatsby, you can really only play once. Yes, that's true. Yeah. You know, it's a, Gatsby is what I call a shtick game. Where once you know the right. shtick, you can't. Yep. You know, you can't. Yeah, it has a big reveal. Once you know the reveal, it's ruined right. for you right. to play again. Yeah. yeah. Um, which, you know, is, is, that's not a negative thing. You know, it's, no. it's awesome. Because the reveal is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And then <laughs> yeah. once you've gotten the reveal, then you can start to become a GM for it and that sort of thing. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's really a neat scenario. So um, we've, we've talked about a lot of systems and things like that. What are your kind of system agnostic, like top three, you know, you're a GM. What is your GMing advice? You know, what are some, what are, what are the, the, like the three things that you think are most important as a, as a GM for running yeah. games? Um, so <laughs> the, 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 the biggest thing is, uh, understand what it is that your players want, right. And, and give them all moments to shine based on what it is that they want. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is especially true in convention games. Uh, it's one of the it's one of the biggest complaints that people often have in convention games, which is that <clears throat> you'll you'll go to a convention game and the GM will will say here are the here are the characters to play, and you might say oh I want the I want the talker I want the guy who negotiates and does all that sort of thing right and the entire scenario is combat and strategy driven and there is no opportunity whatsoever for that character to shine because there's there's no moment written in there for them to be able to do that there's no time where they've tricked the guards because they can talk really well there's there's nothing like that in the scenario and that player leaves that table really disappointed and they don't have a very good time um, because the gm didn't think about you know what's necessary to give that character their moment or uh, you know or two or three moments throughout the course of the game so that's a big one really be thinking about it and and, and that's also true when you're running uh campaigns like think about what it is that those characters uh want 
you know, why has, you know, someone chosen to play a cleric if you're never going to give them a chance to heal somebody or you're never going to get them a chance to do the thing that's that's cool about their character, like you've completely defeated their their desire to play that kind of character. Yeah, um, and if you're running a campaign, check in on that. You know, like every once in a while, a couple months or whatever, just be like, hey, you said that this is what you wanted to do. Are you getting that? Because there are more that you want to do. Do you want to change that? You know, I even will sometimes be, if I'm running like a Cthulhu uh, campaign, I will actually ask people like, give me the two skills you want to use the most. And then I will make sure those skills come up. Because if, you know, I had a I had a poor character who had pilot and every time they got on a boat, he's like, could I drive the boat? And I'm right. like, well, it's an ocean liner. Uh, sure, they'll take you up there and you know let you fool around a little. Just because I kept hoping he'd fumble and drive it into a, 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 a an iceberg or something. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, character players when they build their characters are essentially telling you what they want to play in the game. Like these are the things that I want to have happen. Right. I, I'm building this kind of character because I want cool opportunities to do things. So so there's there, there's that. Um, for uh, for scenarios, uh, scenario building, um, don't confine the ending of your scenario to one solution. Um, you know, I, I almost always have two or three solutions, and then I'm open to whatever kind of <laughs> crazy nonsense the players throw at me as they come into the end of the scenario. Because if they can think of an ending, a solution that I haven't thought of, that is really, really satisfying for the players. And it's really fun for me, especially if it's better than the right. ending yeah. I thought of, right? <laughs> like when that happens, that's that's gold as a GM. You're like, I can give them a big win. We can have a really great finish and it's completely their invention. That That is really great. Yeah, I love, um, it's it's something that I need to do more of, but the I love the idea of having like in your head, here are three ways this can end. And you, because then you can go back through the scenario and seed clues or seed like opportunities that build to that kind of here's how it can end sort of thing. Yeah. And, and give, you know, and, and you can then give the characters, you know, the tools that they need, the resources that they need at the end to accomplish those things. Right? They may be tough and <laughs> they may be really difficult to do. Uh, but, you know, if they have the tools and they have some options, then that's way more fun for them than to really feel like there's only one way that I can finish this scenario. Um, and, you know, kind of related to that, um, and this has really come to fore as I've run more games with Monty Cook games, is that, um, that not every scenario needs to end with a boss fight. Um, scenarios can end satisfactorily with negotiation, with people being clever and solving some sort of problem and, and sort of wrapping up the story because they solve the problem in a really clever and interesting way. Um, so that's, you know, that, that, that's another, that's another piece of it. it. And it just, that has to do with sort of the mentality of going into a game and letting people use problem solving and their own cleverness to solve a scenario, to bring the scenario to a satisfactory conclusion without it always having to be a fight. Yeah, and I think that, that goes back to your second point about sort of baking that in from the beginning and having at least one of those three options be a non, quote unquote, quote unquote non-violent, you know, it might right. be blowing it up from far away, but we're gonna we're gonna call that non-violent, you know, non, non-combat oriented, we'll say. Right. A, a, a solution. So what are, like, if you have your choice, like, what are the, what are the systems that you prefer to run? And is it different online versus in person? Huh? Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, well, that, it's a complex question. So, so a couple of things there. One, um, I think very carefully about what systems I run at conventions because chances are uh, I'm going to have to teach that system. And if it's too complex and too convoluted, then it becomes a it becomes all about the system right. and not about the, the story, not about the characters and, you know, 
happen. And th that's not as much fun for, for people. Uh, it is fun for some people. I mean, I, I go to conventions partly to try out new games and new systems. So that's, uh, you know, so if there's a lot of system stuff that happens during the course of games, like if, that doesn't bother me. Right. right? But, it, but if I'm, uh, but I know a lot of people are interested in the story and the, and the role playing and the character development and all those sorts of things. And if a system gets in the way, that's, that's a problem. Um, so for conventions, I tend to gravitate toward things like, you know, uh, you know, BRP, Call of Cthulhu, that's because it's just dead simple to explain. You have a percentage yeah. chance of succeeding. It's pass fail. Uh, the, the latest version, 7E of Call of Cthulhu, has some nuance that you can play with. It's got a little more crunch in it uh, so that it's not just strictly pass fail, which is which can also be really frustrating for some people. I mean, I, I know people who won't play Call of Cthulhu because they don't like the pass fail um, right. mechanic. They don't have any influence. They can't sort of fudge it one way or the other. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, but it's a dead simple concept to explain. Um, I'm a big fan of Cypher System. Uh, Cypher System has a little bit of wonkiness to it. It can be very complex, but it can also just be really, really simple. And I've run a number of really simple games using the Cypher System. It's a D20. Basically, a D20 is all you need. You don't need a whole bunch of other other dice. You'll need a D6 when you're doing recovery. But it, it's so simple because there there aren't a whole whole lot of other things to get in the way. Um, at conventions, I also like the one roll engine, um, but that Speaking one's a little of some tough crunch, for people that's... to get their head around initially. A lot of that relies on the GM knowing that system really well and being able to very quickly deal with things. Um, I looked at, I thought about run, running a game using that system online, and I realized you can't run one roll engine online. Yeah, because you have to look at the whole entire dice pool, and that, oh god, that would be... Yeah, you have to look at everyone's dice pool, and it has to stay on the table, and virtual tabletops, I mean, I, I primarily use Roll20, but none of the virtual tabletops that I've been on, like... The dice don't retain. I mean, right. they say they stay in a window and you can see them. But as soon as people start messaging and doing like all that information goes away, so yeah. you have to write them all down. There's there's just a lot of friction. Yeah, there. I have not uh, honestly found many online. I have not found any of the online systems that you know. I, I mean, I go rules light anyway, and I'm not in. But I I, I haven't found any really good implementations of online rules that. You know, add that add enough for me to not just go. Let's do theater of the mind. Yeah, um, there's um, yeah. I mean, I'm playing in a um, mutant year zero game right now, uh, and that has a, that has pretty good uh, like on online stuff. And I forget which virtual tabletop we're using for that, but uh, that that works pretty well. Um, so. I mean, yeah, yeah I've, Roll20 is fine for what it is, yeah. but, you know, I just, I I don't want that stuff to get in the way, you know, and I yeah. mean, but but then again, I'm weird. I don't even care for, I don't even really do tactical combat, you know, so um, uh, take what I say with massive grains <laughs> of salt in, in that regard. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm with you there because, you know, often I, I tell players when they sit down at a game, like, I don't, that. I, as a GM, don't run tactical games. If you start to get tactical, uh, I'm going to start throwing monsters at you or explosions right. or something because uh, you know, that's because what you, you want. <laughs> because you're going to spend you if you spend a lot of time being tactical, like the very next round, whatever what, whatever you planned is going to go out the window. Like that's <laughs> that's just it. Um, and so, like, uh, yeah, yeah, it's. I mean, it's. It, part of it is just, I, I think it's good to set expectations. Like, this is what kind of game this is, you know, and then, and 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 that's where sort of that, um, the open door kind of safety uh, policy of like, look, here's exactly what this game is. And you are welcome, you know, like, if that's not what you want, I, I, I encourage you to to go find another game, uh, you know, that, that will make you happier. Um and and that's a but that's a tough balance with the give the players what they want versus you know the players want a tactical combat game. <laughs> yeah, and there's yeah, and, and and you can you can thread the needle there if you if you do it right. 
you know, I mean, there's there's a certain amount of tactics and planning and, you know, knowing whether, you know, someone is behind a building and, you know, all yeah. those sorts of things that, that, that are important, right? That are important enough um, that you can that you can do that. But yeah, I mean, I, I do so much now this theater of the mind that, you know, like I rarely, you know, put up a battle mat. I mean, I use the virtual tabletop to show images <laughs> right? And, yeah. and, and things like that. And for Invisible Sun, there's actually, even though it's a role-playing game, there's a game board. So that's important uh, to have available to the players. So yeah, there's a, well, yeah, I could do a lot of explaining there, but um, <laughs> magic changes slightly throughout the game system. And so you, you move along the path of the suns uh, mm -hmm. and every time there's uh, in, in combat, every time there's a new round, you play a new, what's called a sooth card. It's a special deck of cards that comes with the game. And it alters slightly how magic works. And so every round, magic is shifting around ever so slightly. When you're in narrative mode, when you're, when you're playing you know, more role-playing scenes, every time you change scenes or something major is introduced into a scene, like new people show up or, you know, a bomb goes off or you know something major happens to change you, you play a new sooth card and then magic again shifts slightly um in, in the game so that's uh, a, I, I think that's a really <laughs> cool idea huh yeah well, and, and because each one of those on the path of the suns each pat each sun has a different color that also influences what's happening to magic in the game hmm. so um yeah, so that's why the players need to be able to see that right. reference. Right, to, to all see where time. it's coming. You can plan ahead a little in in some ways. You know, right. that's that's interesting, huh? All right, well, um, you've been very generous with your time. I really appreciate it. So let's just close out with the Space Jam question. Martians have invaded the Earth, and they will destroy the Earth unless you give them a great four hour game that entertains them. So Matt Steele, <laughs> what are you running? What system? What scenario? How are you saving the Earth? So, the, um, the the most likely game that I would pull out would be a game that uh, that, that I've I've run bef many times before. Uh, it's a game in Numenera um, called titled "Forgetting Doomsday." So it's a published scenario by Monica Games, and the setup for that game is that there are, there are at the end of each end of a valley are two small cities. And they were started by two brothers. And originally their goal was to grow the cities across the valley and make them one city, right? <clears throat> um, but things went wrong, brothers fight with each other. And eventually they went to war against each other. And the space in between them is this decimated wasteland. Um, and something goes wrong out in the decimated wasteland that affects both, both uh, towns. And groups from each town come out um, and come to this place in the middle of the valley and have to work together to resolve what's happening. Or it has detrimental effects to both. Right. Uh -huh. so, so, you know, if I'm trying to talk to aliens right, and trying to convince them that we're, we're worth saving, right, that's a scenario where, you know, I can describe, like, hey, this is – this is how we think. Yes, we're warlike. Yes, we can do horrible things. But but yes, we can also come together for mutual good and solve problems and make the world a better place because the nature of the game itself, the nature of Numenera, especially the new edition um, or you know the, the, the updated version of Numenera um, is all about uh, going out, finding interesting things, bringing them back, and, and building a civilization, right? Building a better civilization. Um, so that really talks to the strengths of who we are as, as a species. <laughs> and no so one for else aliens, that's a great this. scenario. No one else has ever used this as a metaphor for humanity. That is a that is a beautiful thing. You know, you've <laughs> you've you've not only made them an entertaining game, but you've sort of demonstrated who we are as a people. That's. Uh, that's a fine, that is as good an answer as you're going to get. Well, um, Matt, thank you so much for, we, I mean, there's so much more we could talk about. You run conven <laughs> you run a convention, you, you know, these mega games. So um, we're going to, we're going to have further episodes down the line where we'll be talking with Matt again, but um, I really appreciate you spending the time with us and uh, uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Ezra. Looking forward right. to the next time we're able to get together in person and uh, do some uh, crazy. 
I, I hope it, I hope it is sooner rather than later. Uh, thank you all for your likes, your subscribes, for watching. We really appreciate it. And uh, don't forget, uh, keep the game moving. <laughs>